uh, and welcome everyone to the National Women's Business Council December public meeting. This is our first meeting of the new fiscal year and we are really thrilled that you are all are joining us today. So I will call the meeting officially to order uh, at this time and we will start with an official roll call of the council members. Please say present when I call your name. Roz Alpert. Present. Antonella Pianalto in for Marsha Bailey. Present. Rosanna Privitera Biondo. Kimberly Blackwell. Present. Tina Biles Williams. Shelly Kapoor Collins. Present. Jamie Knack. Present. Dr. <laughs> Pam Prince Eason. Present. Magdala Racine Silva. Present. Ann Shibunko Moore. Present. Rose Wang. Present. And Laura Yamanaka. Present. Thank Teresa you. Teresa is here as well. I'm sorry, who was that? Teresa Nelson is here as well. Terrific. Thank you, Teresa. And thank you very much, council members, for joining us and dialing in. We have a very full agenda for today's meeting. First, we will have updates to share from the council. Council, Our committee chairs will report on our recent engagement and communication efforts. They will share updates on our ongoing research projects and then give you a sneak peek of the recommendations that we'll be officially submitting to the SBA, the Congress, and the White House in our annual report, which comes out later this month. Part two of today's meeting will be an interactive and engaging dialogue on women and scaling called Preparing to Grow, Learning What Makes the Scale Up. Okay. Somebody has us on music hold. All right. All right. Where we'll have three successful women entrepreneurs joining us to share their own growing pains, the lessons learned, and their best practices from growing their businesses. We also have three representatives to speak about three terrific programs dedicated to helping women scale, including ASEA, EY's Entrepreneurial Winning Women, and SBA's Scale Up America Initiative. And we are very honored to have all three of them be a part of today's program, and I hope you all will enjoy it. Uh, Sumita Mukop Mukopaidai, our newest member and the Director of Communication and Strategic Engagement, is sitting with me here today. And I would be remiss, and she would kill me, frankly, if I did not do some social media call-outs. So please follow us on Twitter at, at NWBC to follow today's conversations, live tweet, and send us questions. There will be a chance for Q&A following both parts of today's agenda. We'll give instructions at that time for you to chime in with a question. You can also direct questions and comments to the chat prompt in this webinar. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbcgov. And lastly, you can always email us at info at nwbc.gov. So that's all for housekeeping, so let's get started. As you all know, the National Women's Business Council is committed to producing best-in-class, actionable research on the most relevant issues facing women in business and those who aspire to start and lead businesses, translating research into recommendations, initiatives, and other tools and resources. The other thing that we're focused on is convening the women's business ecosystem to drive strategic alignment and collaboration around a coordinated agenda. And finally, building momentum and the platform to expand and improve opportunities for women in business and their enterprises. Today you're going to hear about the different ways that we are delivering on these commitments, building on our conviction that research is our springboard for action. We've had a very eventful quarter, full of notable moments, events, and successes. In just a few minutes, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, the council committee chairs. You'll hear from them about our current research portfolio, the many events that we did and partnered on to convene and hear directly from women business owners across the country, and the celebrations for the 26th anniversary of the Council, Women's Small Business Month, the inaugural Women's Entrepreneurship Day, and Small Business Saturday, which happened very recently. 
I also want to call your attention to our biggest project this quarter, and that's our soon-to-be-released annual report. As many of you know, the one deliverable that the council has every year is an annual report to our three, as I like to put it, our three customers, the White House, the SBA, and Congress. The council worked diligently this quarter to learn from our completed research projects in 2014, our collaborations, our convened meetings, and other insights to discern and identify the challenges that still remain and the obstacles that impede the growth and origination of women-owned and women-led businesses. The result of this work will be articulated in a set of policy recommendations around our four core pillars that we'll share in this report. The numbers confirm that the full economic participation of women and their success in business is critical to the continued economic recovery and job growth in this country. And as the Council, we are committed to sustaining the potential the women entrepreneurs present. We are very honored to be a part of the movement to impact and better the business climate for women, and we are honored that you are joining us today for what is the final meeting of this calendar year and our first meeting of the fiscal year 2015. So with that, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Shelley Kapoor Collins. Shelley is the chair of the Council's Communication and Outreach Committee. Shelley, the mic is all yours. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Carla. Really appreciate it. And I really appreciate everyone joining our call today. This fall, we had a very eventful, engaging couple of months. I, I'm sorry, I can only see the slide with me on it. Is the, are we on the next slide? Thank you very much. So just to start off this fall, we had a really eventful, engaging couple of months. As a council, we were, connect, we were able to connect with different constituencies through meetings, presentations, content, and online engagement. Uh, to give you some examples, listed here also, and I'll elaborate, in October, we celebrated Women's Small Business Month and our own birthday. As Carla mentioned, uh, the anniversary of the passing of H.R. 5050, the Women's Business Ownership Act of 1998, which led to the founding of our council, was October 25th. We attended and presented at events and conferences in partnership with great organizations such as Thumbtack, Business Forward, and the National Women's Association of Real Estate Businesses. And I was lucky enough to host Samita and Amanda in my own San Francisco uh, for a very successful uh, event on microbusinesses in late October, and it was a packed house. We missed the rest of our council members there. And Jamie Knapp was also, um, has also served as a wonderful moderator for the event. We also coordinated a successful digital strategy and engaged an online audience with fun and dynamic content that was shared widely. Finally, we wrote our annual report, uh, which is listed here, Building Bridges, um, which is just chock full of our activities, research update, recommendations, and the Council's proposed agenda for 2015. And you're going to get a sneak peek of that in just a few minutes. Moving on to our uh, you know, to our toolkit, we, the council, at the last council meeting, we shared our key findings from two projects on access to capital for high growth women entrepreneurs. And that's contained here in the infographic toolkit on access to capital. In October, the council released a complimentary toolkit which, which highlights and makes it easier to understand the kind of capital that women have available to them. The infographic provides strategy and advice on different types of capital and how to approach the pursuit of funding. The council created this product to help women business owners becoming, to become more grounded in the many financing options that are available. The infographic is based on interviews with Noha Websnader, who's founder of uh, Field Snacks, our own council member Jamie Knack, and founder of President of Three Squares, and Laura Yamanaka, council member and president of Team CFO. And in case you did miss a release, you can still find it on our website at www.nwdc.gov. And moving on to my, perhaps one of my favorite slides that I'm going to be talking about, um, our chairwoman, Carla Harris, uh, has spoken in a video. To celebrate Women's Entrepreneurship Day on November 19th, the council released a video featuring Carla Harris speaking in support of the Women's Small Business, Business Ownership Act of 2014. This bill calls for a few different things, including, first, allowing sole source contracting for federal contracts awarded through the Women-Owned Small Business Contract Program. It asks to expand and improve the SBA microloan and intermediary lending programs 
so that we can reach more women borrowers who need up to $50,000, as well as reauthorize the SBA's Intermediary Lending Program. The bill also asks for increasing funding for the Women's Business Center Program, which expands and improves counseling and training services to reach more women entrepreneurs, especially in low-income areas. And finally, the bill was asking to require data on women-owned small businesses by establishing a 2015 deadline for an SBA study. Time is running out for this one, but please know that the Council will continue to advocate for these provisions and more. And moving on, I'd, la I'd now like to turn this over to my colleague and fellow Council member, Magdala Racing Silva. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shelley. I'm pleased to share progress about our research portfolio today. The Council's commissioned research is well underway at this point, and the fiscal year 2014 research portfolio builds upon the 2013 research that was completed, as well as on other insights demonstrating the Council's continued commitment to pursue research that really enables data-driven policy recommendations, such that the women entrepreneurs have the tangible, effective resources and in an environment, quite frankly, that they need to grow and successfully scale their business. The projects in fiscal year 2014 will deepen our understanding of the factors that have a significant impact on the ability of women entrepreneurs to scale, thereby driving economic growth. And yes, all of our projects build on the pillars of our work to help build a significant gap in the literature of these fields. For example, our corporate supplier diversity project is tied to our access to markets pillar, and the undercapitalization and social networks research is aligned with access to capital, and the accelerators and incubators research is aligned both with capital and job creation and growth. All of this research is intended to empower the Council and to provide actionable issue briefs, recommendations, and resources for our key stakeholders and women entrepreneurs. A quick overview of the 2014 research the Women's Participation in Corporate uh, Supplier Diversity. The goal of this project is to develop a body of knowledge on opportunities for women entrepreneurs in corporate supplier diversity programs. As there is little data that has been gathered on the size and the nature of these markets, what we do know is that out of the 18 companies of the Billion Dollar Roundtable, there was $54.5 billion spend on minority-owned and women-owned suppliers in 2012. The potential impact of increasing spend with women-owned businesses across all of the corporate community is not just substantial, it's game-changing. The other project is the Women's Entrepreneur Social Networks. This project seeks to develop an understanding of whether there are structural differences in the entrepreneurial networks of male and female entrepreneurs, and to what extent these differences influence development and success of female entrepreneurs. The Women's Participation in Incubators and Accelerators Project. The purpose of this study is to analyze how firms are selected by incubators and accelerators, factors that influence the successful graduation of new women-owned businesses, including gender awareness by the programs, and recommendations on how these incubators and accelerators actually contribute to the growth of women-owned businesses and the undercapitalization as a contributing uh, factor to business failure project. This research seeks to explore the roles that access to capital and undercapitalization have on business outcomes for women-owned firms in particular. Because of the fact that we lack insight into the specific circumstances and decision-making process around business closure, particularly as it pertains to the levels of financial capital, hopefully this research is going to be the third in a series of access on capital. We are also doing a fifth project, which is mapping the women's entrepreneurship landscape in conjunction with the SBA Office of Women's Business Ownership in Carnegie Mellon University. This project will look at the organization supporting women entrepreneurs and how the broad ecosystem works together. The students working on this have already started scoping, but the project will probably officially launch in, in mid-January. Next slide, please. I am also particularly excited about a new initiative born from our last in-person meeting of the Group of Six. We've heard repeatedly that there is an abundance of information available to women entrepreneurs on the different challenges and resources available as women grow their businesses. However, there is often so much information that it can be difficult to navigate and find exactly the right guidance and quick access to resources when needed. 
Building on this observation, the group of six is looking to collectively build a business life cycle framework. The goal is to plot a business life cycle from startup to sale of the business with resources, recommendations, and FAQs at the different inflection points along the growth journey with the intent to consolidate a one-stop shop of valuable, tangible, and targeted information depending on where a business owner is in her growth path and the resources that are available to guide women along the journey towards success. This will eventually become a web portal featuring real-life stories from women entrepreneurs and cataloging and organizing resources to help women entrepreneurs shorten the time to gain knowledge to help them make the right decision. And we all know knowledge is power. We are looking forward to sharing this new web portal with you all next year. Thank you all, and now I will turn the presentation over to Rose to discuss our recommendations for 2015. Rose? Thank you, Magdala, and hello, everyone. Uh, I have the privilege today of sharing the uh, sneak, pre sneak peek preview of the Council's annual report. Just like the uh, business life cycle framework that Magdala was speak spoken of, the, uh, we have found that there are a lot of uh, aspects of um, entrepreneurship and, and, and entrepreneurship ecosystem that needs to be put into a framework, and that's what you're seeing right now in front of you. Uh, we have decided to organize our recommendations that we make annually on this framework developed by Dan Eisenberg at Babson College. Uh, the recommendations that we make annually are to the SBA, the Congress, and the White House. They are directed by previous NWBC efforts, the implications of our research and the research of other entities, and needs expressed by council members and, and our key stakeholders. This model that you're looking at recognizes that entities such as other individuals, organizations, or institutions together create an environment that can either foster or discourage individuals' decision to launch or scale ventures, as well as their likelihood of success. Many of the Council's recommendations address the main elements, such as policy, finance, culture, the kind of support they get, human capital, and markets. Other recommendations touch multiple elements in recognition that these elements overlap and influence one another. On this map, you will find recommendations for future research. This has already informed our current and future research portfolios. Our other recommendations include curricula in entrepreneur education and STEM programs, matchmaking programs that improve women business owners' access to federal and corporate markets, and highlighting success stories to provide more role models. Very importantly, in the policy arena, we'll continue to push for small business lending data, equity crowdfunding rules, making progress on the 5% federal procurement goal by increasing the quality and quantity of tools available to contracting officers and even exploring affordable childcare and tax incentives for investment in women-owned businesses. I know this is a very ambitious agenda, but one that we believe in. These recommendations will build on the momentum of positive change that we've already seen in the last few years. Next slide, please. We've actually already started on some of these items, so allow me to uh, explain in a few, a few more minutes. First, gender awareness at accelerators and incubators. We will be partnering with the SBA to review the 800-plus applications that were submitted for the 2.5 million SBA Growth Accelerator Fund earlier this year. This is a great opportunity to learn about gender-aware accelerators and their programming. Number two, uh, in terms of implication and recommendation, increasing the number of women making investment decisions. The Council in partnership with the SBA Office of Investment and Innovation, hosted a roundtable discussion about improving and strengthening the pipeline for women into careers in finance this past October. This was the inaugural event in a series to better understand the full pipeline of female talent 
and identify strategies to increase the participation of women in the broadly defined financial services industry with a focus on principal investing. The third recommendation is passing the sole source provision in the NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization Act. There was a great victory last week that I'm really thrilled to share. We learned that the final text of the National Defense Authorization Act was released and has included within it is the authority for sole source contracts in the women-owned small business procurement program. While this will not solve all of the challenges we have, it is a huge step forward. I'm personally thrilled. We are all thrilled. And this is uh, uh, 12, 15 years in the making since the law was first passed in 2000. Allowing sole source contracting federal contracts awarded through the Women-Owned Small Business Federal Contract Program would put women-owned businesses on equal footing with other disadvantaged groups in the contracting process. This will, we will finally have parity. This provision will change current law and aims to help the federal government meet its goal of awarding 5% of contracts to women-owned businesses. If I don't remind you, I know Carla will, when the 5% goal is not reached, Women-owned companies miss out on $2.6 billion of, of federal contracting opportunities every year. I think I got that number right. I could be wrong. It could be a bigger number. So with that, I'll transition back to Carla, and we can take questions and answers and proceed to part two. Let me just close with this. We're super excited about what is to come this year and hope to see action, actions on all of these recommendations. You can get the full details of the proposed research, initiatives, and recommendations in our soon-to-be-released annual report, so look out for it. Back to you, Carla. Thank you very much, Shelley, Magdala, and Rose. As you can see from these updates, we've been busy, very busy for the past few months. I'd now like to open it up briefly for questions on any of what you've heard or if there are any questions broadly for uh, NWBC. Remember also that you can tweet questions to at NWBC or using the hashtag, hashtag scale up. You can email questions also to info at NWBC.gov or you can use the chat prompt on the side of your webinar. So we'll just give a couple of minutes uh, for uh, any questions. Thank you, Carla. We're not seeing anything on Twitter yet or in the info at email, so. Okay. We'll give people another 15 to 30 seconds, and if there are no questions, then I'm really excited to move on to the next part of our presentation. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on, but if you do have questions, please feel free, again, to tweet them or to email, the, email them, and if we have time at the end of part two, we will go back and answer some of those questions for you. I want to actually pick up where Rose left off. In 2015, the Council will continue to conduct research and engage key stakeholders in alignment with our four-pillar strategy. And as you all have heard me say before, the four pillars of our strategy are data collection, access to capital, access to markets, and access to jobs, job creation and growth. Data is the foundation. The Council leads a small number of government entities that seeks to expand the quality and the quantity of data on women-owned businesses. And we will continue to make progress in measuring the tide of women's economic impact. But as you all know, we cannot count what we do not measure. Access to essential business assets, that's really all about capital, capital and markets. And it continues to be a challenge for way too many women. Our work here will focus on changing the infrastructure and increasing and improving the resources and the access to those resources so more women can access the capital they need to start and grow their businesses and enter new and emerging marketplaces. Our goal is to ensure more women-owned and women-led businesses and to ensure that they can scale and thus create more jobs and help the continued growth and expansion of our economy. 
And this is the conversation that we are hoping to facilitate today. The work of the council is grounded in an understanding that women have innovative ideas and that women are leaders. We know women are launching businesses that create value and solve problems, but the key for us is to illuminate those businesses and the DNA associated with creating and scaling those businesses. We need the innovative ideas, and we need your focus and dedication to get it done. In your tenacity, in all that you do, in serving your customers, in collaborating with your suppliers, we need to understand what that looks like and to spread that to other women, women entrepreneurs. And that's really why we wanted to have the conversation that we're going to have today. As I said, as women leaders, we need to share the intellectual and experiential DNA that has been learned and earned by other successful entrepreneurs. If we always have to reinvent the wheel, we will never be able to move the ball forward and massively expand the impact that women entrepreneurs can have uh, in, in our country and, frankly, in the world. There's been much media and cultural attention paid to America's startup culture, and the Council's portfolio reflects that. And as we shift into our new agenda for 2015, we want to shine light on another critical stage of building a business, and that is the scale-up. We want to talk today about what are the fears associated with growth, what are the best practices as women entrepreneurs pursue growth, how can more women access the growth capital that their companies need in order to move quickly and to respond to market changes and to grow and collaborate with larger organizations? What are the programs, more importantly, the programs and resources that women entrepreneurs can leverage as they pursue growth? We know two things. Success stories matter and that scaling a business is no easy task. Successful scaling requires recognizing new priorities and de-emphasizing old ones while moving at a breakneck pace. It requires financing strategies that enable nimble responses to new challenges. We're very excited for our roundtable of dynamic panelists today to share their stories with you. Our panelists have made it through this stage, and they've come out smiling on the other side. First, we want to highlight some programs and resources. Astia? EY's Entrepreneurial Winning Women, and SBA's New Scale Up America initiative. Let me introduce them all now. First, Carrie is a woman of many talents. She is a senior principal in EY Young, in Ernst & Young's excuse me, financial service office in New York. She also serves as executive sponsor of EY's North American Entrepreneurial Winning Women program. That's the hat she's wearing today. Carrie McPherson works with women business leaders, fueling their success and accelerating the growth of their companies. And it's one of the most rewarding aspects of her role as a senior advisor. Teresa, who is a member of our council, is a global advisory board member for ASEA. She wears many hats, too. She's also a professor at Simmons College and an entrepreneur herself. She's also a member of, as I said earlier, of the council. ASTIA is a new organization to the council, and we're particularly excited about its high-growth focus. Teresa brings a wealth of insight and perspective to the council. Her goal is to add the voice of high-growth entrepreneurship to the conversation, including expertise around issues of access to capital, and the development and promotion of inclusive entrepreneurial teams. John is the Director of Innovation, Clusters, and Skills Initiatives at the U.S. Small Business Administration. That means he oversees SBA's regional economic development portfolio and the programming to accelerate the growth of entrepreneurship. He also leads the American Supplier Initiative, an administration-wide effort to increase small business participation in private sector supply chains. He previously served as a senior advisor in the Office of Government Contracting and Business Development, too. He's a good guy to know, considering the government spends $500 billion a year in federal contracting. Let me add that federal procurement is another opportunity to grow and scale your business, ladies. I give you Carrie McPherson, Dr. Teresa Nelson, and John Spears. Carrie, 
the floor is yours. Tell us about EY's Entrepreneur Winning Women. Carla, thank you so much, and it was great to listen to the reports from your committee chairs. Clearly, the National Women's Business Council is doing some great and really important work, um, and I'm happy to learn more about it. <clears throat> um, like, like the NWBC, EY is committed to expanding and improving opportunities for women entrepreneurs. Our support in um, in our support of entrepreneurs is firmly embedded in our firm DNA and extends to the highest reaches in our organization. In particular, our strategic growth markets practice has been a leader in advising, guiding, and recognizing entrepreneurial companies owned by men and women for over three decades. And as you said, I feel incredibly privileged to spend time with outstanding women entrepreneurs in my work at EY. As the executive sponsor of our Entrepreneurial Winning Women program, we seek to help high-potential women entrepreneurs think big and scale rapidly. As you've already talked about, we know that women entrepreneurs are a source of our economy's great strengths. Because of women's success in launching new businesses, 46% of privately held U.S. firms are now at least half-owned by women. And these companies represent 18 million jobs, a clear boost to our economy. However, we believe women's business enterprises are not yet the force that they can be. So seven years ago, we created the EY Entrepreneurial Winning Women Program to help even the playing field. We enlisted powerful collaborators like WeBank, WPO, and NABO who are equally determined to increase the number of markets that are run by women. And Carlos, you've talked about in this scale-up thing, we think there's a missing middle stage between startup and market leadership, and it's a stage at, with, at which growth in many women-owned companies stops. In fact, only 2% of women-owned businesses generate more than a million dollars in annual revenue. Those companies need resources and advice to scale up. Through our Entrepreneurial Winning Women program, we share EY's resources with high potential women entrepreneurs, including our network of investors, so back to your talk about capital, mentors, potential partners, and customers, as well as what we've learned from working with high growth entrepreneurial companies over the last 30 years. We believe strongly in the power and potential of women entrepreneurs, and we understand that improved access to capital, mentors, and networks can make a tremendous difference to their companies. And the EY Winning Women program is designed to connect high potential entrepreneurs with those resources so they can grow more rapidly. Like you, we do research, and um, four years ago we did our first piece of research and identified five really important things that women entrepreneurs need to do. First and foremost, they need to think big and be bold. They need to build a public profile. They need to work on the business rather than in it. They need to establish key advisory networks. And as pointed out in some of your earlier stuff, they need to evaluate financing for expansion. And we know that it works. According to an independent impact assessment that was done by the Center for Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership at Babson College, North American program participants' total 2013 revenue was 63% higher than their total revenues in the years before they joined the program. Individual participant companies averaged 20% revenue growth and in the second year of participation, many of them grow more than 50%. Winners also report increases in entrepreneurial confidence, growth goals, networks, and media visibility, to name a few. In fact, two of today's speakers are entrepreneurial winning women, Carrie Warburg Block and Phyllis Newhouse. They're both terrific entrepreneurs, and I'm sure they'll tell you some stories about how the program has helped them. Now, you know, I said earlier that fewer than 2% of women businesses um, exceed the million dollars um, in annual growth. 
In fact, we're at a stage now where the average of the women who are participating in our program in the year they came in is around the $12 million mark. And we're confident that many of these organizations will go on to become 50 and 100. We'll be accepting applications again this spring, starting on International Women's Day, March 8, 2015. Please visit our website, ey.com, for more details. You'll see that the requirements include the business be less than 10 years old and have at least two years of revenue in excess of $2 million to be considered eligible. Um, and you'll find helpful tips and studies specifically for women entrepreneurs on our site, including the latest study, Force Multipliers, How Three Fundamental Adaptations Can Help Women Entrepreneurs Scale Big. I hope many of the participants on today's call will take the opportunity to apply for EY's Entrepreneurial Winning Women Program and get involved in the other programs and organizations talked about on this call. Together, I am confident we can help women business owners expand and extend their entrepreneurial success, and that's good for America. It's good for all of us. Carla, back to you. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was outstanding. Um, I'll, I'll ask you a quick question right now. How many women do you, uh, how many entrepreneurs do you have in each cycle of, of uh, the class? Great question. Um, so we now have a, a class of 70, 70. Um, in the early years, we admitted smaller numbers. We now do 12 deserving entrepreneurs a year, um, as selected by a panel of independent judges. So the next 12 will be selected over the course of the summer of 2015, and we'll all be invited to uh, join with our alumni in the fall and attend EY Strategic Growth Forum in Palm Springs in November of next year. Okay. Outstanding. Well, thank you very much. And then we will leave the line open for other questions after we finish uh, the other two panelists. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Teresa Nelson, my fellow council member. Hello, everyone from snowy, blowy Boston. Uh, it's great to be on the call today and to share with all of you some words about Astia and women entrepreneurs and scalability. I'm proud to represent Estia on the National Women's Business Council and to have served on their Global Advisory Board for the last five years. With Sharon Vosnick, Estia's CEO, I recently authored a white paper on the state of women high-growth entrepreneurs and Estia's 15-year growth path to build an ecosystem that supports them. Do check it out. You can access the report at no charge via astia.org. That's A-S-T-I-A dot org. In a few minutes, I'd like to share two points. The first is, what is Astia, and how do we engage with women and their ventures? And the second, what women entrepreneurs can do to engage the high-growth entrepreneurship ecosystem for scalability. First about Astia. We are a community of 5,000 women and men worldwide who are united in our belief that an innovation economy needs women high-growth entrepreneurs, their teams, and their ventures. Our goal is to change how the ecosystem looks at and evaluates high potential organizations. At Astia, we put a value on diversity of leadership in firm startup and growth. In the high growth space, women and men will be working together. That's the nature of this style of entrepreneurship. And we have designed an organization to partner with companies to deliver capital and networks in the high growth space to companies with women in positions of equity and influence. We put together the research to show that inclusive high growth teams deliver better results, and we have a sophisticated interaction system with Astia member companies to link them to what they need in the ecosystem from founding to exit. Under the Astia umbrella, we operate a nonprofit, an angel investing group, and we are building an investment fund. We are stage and industry agnostic and are looking for women entrepreneurs with innovative products intended for large markets. We believe that innovation matters because innovation is about job creation. Many people do not realize that all net new jobs in the last 30 years in the United States were created by high growth companies in the first five years of their growth. And here's where the scalable comes from. 
A high growth venture doesn't only mean that the companies grow quickly in market and revenue. It means that they can do more with less as they grow. So while customer number one might cost $100, customer 100 might cost 10, and customer 1,000 just $1. Now every scalable venture does not need equity funding. Some can grow on customer revenue or from private wealth. But connecting women high growth entrepreneurs with equity funding is where we live. Building a community of corporate investors, venture capitalists, and angel investors who not only will write a check, but will advise and connect new ventures to the resources, including expertise, that they need to succeed at varied stages along the path. So we face the statistics that only 3 to 5% of high growth ventures in the recent past in the U.S. have a women CEO, though more than 50% of all biology and academic medicine PhDs are now earned by women. We are working to change this disconnect, and we have two ideas for you. Number one, if you are a woman entrepreneur, think about the growth potential of your venture before you get too far down the road. It's not just certain industry groups that qualify for outside investment, but it is certain growth trajectories of businesses. So for example, you can have a lovely profitable flower shop in a town or you can be Ruth Awadis, one of Astia's advisors, who created Calyx and Corolla, innovating the first system for ordering and delivering flowers nationwide via the web. One venture is much more scalable than the other. The point here is that most business ideas, most products are scalable if you model them to that goal. So find some experts to help you think that through if that's your interest. Then consider whether equity investment is an option and might be the right option for you to fund the company growth. Second, reach out to accelerators and networks like Astia around equity funding possibilities. Look locally, regionally, and nationally. A lot of this is online now. If you can envision a new product for a large market, Astia would like to hear from you. We think we are in touch with about 10,000 women worldwide who are eligible for a super growth moment in the next decade, and you could be one. All of our application materials are available at astia.org, and there are many additional resources on the NWBC website and through other organizations operating nationwide. Thanks so much for this time to speak with you. Thanks so much, Teresa. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, John Spears. Hi, uh, thanks, Carla, and thanks to the other panelists uh, speaking today. I think there's a lot of synergy uh, in this scale space, and we'd love to connect with you after the call to see how we can leverage some of these resources. Uh, again, my name is John Spears, and I am the Director of Clusters and Skills Initiatives here at the SBA, and essentially I am responsible for creating and fostering healthy ecosystems for small businesses in two key areas. Uh, the first is through our Regional Innovation Clusters Program, uh, and the second is through our Scale Up America Program, which was just launched uh, this uh, September. And, and a lot of the facts uh, were, were communicated today, and it's really good to see folks in the space talking about scaling up. I, I think when you're a part of a conversation and you hear thought leaders talking about the need of ecosystems, and women's participation in ecosystems, as well as incubators and accelerators. It's, it's uh, sort of invigorating for me because I work in this space, and to see people talking about this is, is encouraging. So as was stated, uh, there is a real need to direct support uh, for entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, in this scale-up space. Uh, you, you know the facts. Uh, underrepresented or underserved entrepreneurs have far less business success uh, and challenges in scaling up and getting access to capital, access to markets, uh, access to skills and business capabilities. And we know from an economic perspective that a majority of these new jobs that are being created um, are not just from the startup space, but are really from the sustained incremental expansion of existing businesses in a wide variety of, of industries. But 
prior to our focus, there have been little resources directed at supporting firms uh, in this space and, until uh, we launched uh, Scale America here at the SBA. Uh, and Scale of America really helps to support the administration's job strategy um, by, one, strengthening growth-oriented entrepreneurs, and two, by supporting the development uh, and connection of healthy, thriving ecosystems that support firms uh, in this space. And so uh, this year, on September 30th, SBA announced uh, eight new awards under Scale Up America, and this is a new initiative that's designed to provide the necessary support uh, to help companies with revenue between 150000 and 500K to help them scale up and grow while strengthening and enhancing their local entrepreneurial ecosystems, resulting in their ability to produce economic impact and job growth in their local communities. And a total of $2.2 million was awarded to eight scale-up communities to participate in this inaugural group. And the funds will be used to deliver a proven entrepreneurship education curriculum for growth-oriented entrepreneurs and small businesses. Uh, the funds will also be used to provide one-on-one uh, -on -one ongoing support, mentoring, technical assistance, and business advising, uh, assistance and connections to growth capital, as well as helping to foster and, and develop uh, the local ecosystems uh, and, and their communities. And these uh, communities of focus are as follows. So we, we have these programs in Tucson, Arizona, in the Jacksonville Metropolitan uh, area in Kansas City, Missouri, both Kansas City and, and Kansas, uh, Missouri and Kansas, Aurora, Illinois, uh, Central Ohio, Roanoke, Virginia, Portland, Maine, and uh, Western North Carolina. And each of these communities uh, will again focus on intensive entrepreneurship education. Uh, they're going to focus on management, assistance, and, and support, um, access to capital, uh, and to connections. And as a part of uh, our new administrator, Maria Contreras, sweet vision and priorities, a major piece of this effort is focused on uh, women entrepreneurs as well as underserved and underrepresented firms. And you'll see that in that we have uh, a women's business center as well as a, a small business development center out of Chicago, Illinois, um, and they are focusing on women in the Aurora area. We're excited that that, that that focus on women isn't just with them, but that we're seeing that thread throughout each of our communities that we've chosen, really a, a focus on supporting this demographic and, and meeting the needs of entrepreneurs that, that are in this space. Um, so what's, what's next for our initiative? Well, two things. One, each of these scale-up communities, the, the program managers for these communities, will be here uh, at headquarters uh, tomorrow and Wednesday uh, for a, a two-day training to learn about SBA programs, to share best practices, uh, and to think about ways that they can uh, um, tailor their programs to meet the unique needs of uh, folks in the space. Uh, and then, you know, we are, are very encouraged about uh, this, given Daniel Eisenberg's involvement in Scale Up and the work that he's doing in Milwaukee and, and the work that he's done in the space. Um, but we are, like many other federal agencies and programs at SBA, waiting to see what happens with the uh, federal omnibus on December 11th. We're not sure uh, what the, the Congress will give us in terms of appropriations, but we're looking forward to continuing this work in this space and reaching entrepreneurs um, that are hungry to grow and hungry uh, to scale their businesses. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Carla, and then be happy to take any questions that folks on the line might have. All righty. Thank you, John. Uh, and, and again, thank you, Carrie and Teresa. Uh, I do have a few questions for you guys, actually. Uh, the first one is for, uh, for you, Carrie. Um, and the question is, when you are about to scale your business and you're raising capital, how should you spend that money on people, expansion that way, or in inventory or machinery, i.e., expenses related to your actual product or process? You know, Carol, I, think, I don't think, as you would expect, I don't think there's a single right answer to that. But I will tell you that we've observed that one of the things that many of 
our women entrepreneurs um, do a little bit later than their male counterparts to their detriment is building out their management teams. So <clears throat> when we talk about working on the business rather than in it, we encourage people to take a step back from being the person who's responsible for literally everything that happens in the company, as is often the case in a startup, and figure out those things which only you can do. And for most entrepreneurs, that has to do with sales and building your market. Um, and if, in fact, that is the case, then one of the first things you need is you need a good finance person and you probably need a good operations person to take off your plate all of those other things that are critical to the business but that are not your highest and best use. And so it really, the answer depends on what kind of business you have, where you are in the growth cycle, how quickly you're going to grow, and so on. But overall, making sure that you have the ability to do those things that matter most because only you can do them generally will mean you have to start to build out your leadership. Okay, terrific. Thank you. And, Teresa, the next question I believe is for you. Uh, if you have a high-growth business, how much equity should you be prepared to give up when you first start to scale? So this one, we're very lucky it has a right answer, which is as little as possible. And I mean that somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Um, but, again, I think, as Carrie said with the last question, um, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on what stage of growth you're already at, what milestones you've already reached. Clearly, the more risk involved, the more return an investor is going to expect. Um, two points I'd make about equity investment that I think are important and related to this question. One is never think about equity investment as an end game. Um, you know, it's very unlikely that any high-growth firm will get one investment of money and that's the end of their process of, of financing their business. So, uh, you know, you might have some seed funding, then you might have some A, B, and C rounds, you might have some venture capital, you might have friends and family. So. You have to really be thinking about this as a business development funnel and how you're going to manage that. And I think the best way to think about that is very early on to have some experts around you who are on your side, who are members of your team. And that doesn't mean that they work for you necessarily, but that you've been in touch with people who've been there, done that, and been at the other side of the table. And then finally, realize that this is a true negotiation on your part as an owner of a company. So you, you expect everyone to be negotiating, and you have to be clear from day one that you're representing yourself and your business, and you're hoping to come out with the des best deal possible. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, and John, uh, there are two questions for you. Would you repeat the sizes that you all are looking for in, uh, in terms of some of these uh, scale-up awards, number one? And number two, um, is the money from the SBA going to the Women's Business Centers for distribution to the women entrepreneurs, or is there a mechanism for the money to go directly to the entrepreneurs? So, so great questions. Um, let me answer the, the first one, uh, the second one first. We are awarding the, these are contracts because of our ability in our office to give give out grants, but we are awarding dollars to organizations on the ground, service providers that are doing this work on behalf of SBA. And so the money goes directly to uh, women's business centers or economic development organizations or small business development centers on the ground to help uh, do these four things. Like I said, the uh, intensive uh, entrepreneurial education, capital connections, ongoing management uh, assistance, and then ecosystem development. And so the money goes directly to those organizations, and some of those have seed funding, some of those have uh, other investment opportunities, but the money goes directly to those organizations. And then regarding the first question, if you can repeat that, because I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, what the question was. It, you mentioned in your presentation that there was a certain size of businesses that um, yeah. you all were looking to, uh, to fund, and I was just asking you to repeat that. Great. And so just to clarify, we, again, aren't funding businesses themselves, but we're investing in ordering dollars to organizations that will in turn provide support on the ground. Understood. The, 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 um, 
the revenues threshold that we're looking at is $50,000 a year uh, to $500,000 a year. And the reason we're choosing this subset of firms is that SBA already has uh, a program called Emerging Leaders. It's currently in 27 cities. Uh, it is expanding to, I think, roughly 40 cities this year that helps to support uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs in the 500K to sort of $2 million range. And so we're really looking uh, to focus on these underserved and underrepresented firms uh, through this scale-up initiative. Okay, that is, that's terrific. Thank you very much. And we, we have one more question, but we're going to um, deal with that one after we get to, to the panel, uh, because I think i got a feeling that the panelists will have a perspective on this, but I think, uh, Teresa, you in particular will probably want to chime in on this one as well. And that was from Mary P., so I'll wait until we finish the panelists uh, and, then, uh, and then go to that question. So, again, let me say thank you very much, Terry and Teresa and John, uh, for expounding on the terrific programs. And now for the panel. We've gathered together a group of successful women entrepreneurs to share their experiences from their own growing pains during their scale-up stage. Uh, we have Vanessa Green, CEO of Thin6, Carrie Warburg-Block, CEO of EarthKind, Inc., and Phyllis Newhouse, CEO and founder of Extreme Solutions. Vanessa, excuse me? Okay. Vanessa co-founded Thin6 as an MBA student at MIT Sloan. Her company is an advanced power electronics company that enables smaller, lighter power solutions for consumer devices. Fin6 was recently selected as an Inc. 35 under 35 company, and Vanessa has won a number of prestigious awards. MIT's Patrick E. McGovern Entrepreneurship Award and was selected as a Boston Business Journal Innovation All-Stars Rising Star and Forbes 30 under 30 in energy. We first were introduced to Vanessa via Astia. She's one of the Astia Angels Investments. She's grown her company significantly and is ready for her Series B with a valuation that will be three to five times her Series A. Now, how's that for being impressive? Carrie Warburg Block is a mother of invention. With two small children at home, she was determined to find a natural solution that would rid the family farm of rodents. At the time, 90% of pest control solutions contained dangerous toxins. So Carrie created Fresh Cab, the first botanical rodent repellent safe enough to use at home, but strong enough to meet federal EPA standards for efficiency. Today, her, pro her products are in 55,000 retail stores throughout the U.S. and Canada. She is a champion of sustainability and entrepreneurship. Through the employment of developmentally disabled citizens and a responsible 2% carbon footprint, Carrie is setting a new standard for businesses. She, too, is an award winner, Inc. 500, the 5,000 fastest growth companies, former Indie Small Business Person of the Year, and national runner-up for National Small Business Person of the Year by the SBA. Carrie is also a member of the 2012 EY Entrepreneur Winning Women class. So she can add very well to Carrie's comments. Phyllis Newhouse is a retired United States Army non-commissioned officer, and she founded her company in 2002. Extreme Solutions is an end-to-end -end IT services and solutions provider with offerings that range from IT business consulting to state-of-the-art cybersecurity consulting and forensic analysis. The company has been recognized by the Women Presidents Organization as one of the top 50 fastest growing women-owned businesses in 2014 and 2013. Inc. Magazine's Higher Power Awards honors Extreme Solutions Inc. for ranking fifth in Georgia jobs creation, tenth in revenue, and 18th in job growth over the past three years. Phyllis is a member of NABO and WPO, and she herself has a number of military awards and business recognitions. When we first approached EY Entrepreneur Winning Women about this idea, mm -hmm. she said, you have to meet Phyllis. She employs more ethical hackers than any other company in the world. Mm -hmm. 
thank you all for joining us today. This is going to be a great conversation. To get us started, I propose that each of the panelists talk us through the early stages of their companies. What were the major inflection points in your company's growth process? We'll start there, and then I will ask you each uh, questions as we move throughout the conversation. And with that, why don't you kick it off with that first question, Carrie? Sure, I'd be happy to. I started my business with a problem. We had mice on the farm. There wasn't a solution that worked. Uh, basically, I asked him a question, why kill them? Why not just prevent them from coming in? And basically, that's where the business started. I had no money. I had no experience. But I did have the passion and the purpose uh, that, that I really wanted to make a change in the marketplace. So um, there was an inflection point there when I found out how big the problem actually was. It wasn't just me. And going about how I was going to commercialize that product, I had to learn how to work through um, federal EPA, um, navigate those requirements. Uh, I had to learn how to get a loan. I applied for my first business loan of $500 and was turned down because I had no credit. I had to get a co-signer. I decided that needed to change as well and was <laughs> unacceptable. I worked with uh, Women's Business Center in the state of North Dakota um, and determined to make it. So I figured out how to get the product patented, how to manufacture it with the help of local universities in our state, um, some score business counselors, and a few mentors. I was able to get that product into several thousand stores, and um, it became very successful. And that's where the, um, <laughs> the second stage started. And, mm -hmm. and when I was inducted into the Winning Women program, we um, basically had seen, I think it was $20 million in cumulative revenues with this product, which was totally disruptive on the marketplace. Um, competitors were nipping at our heels. There had been no change in the category or no new innovation for decades, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden things started to speed up, and um, we had been growing at 45% mm -hmm. annual growth for the past five years before entering the program, and um, I realized that just it wasn't fast enough to quickly scale up and get that product out there, um, and we were at this inflection point. Either we had to sell or we had to scale, and that's when I came into the Winning Women program. Okay, thank you. Phyllis? Uh, so m my uh, company started as when I retired from the military in 1999. Um, I worked in the cyber forensic laboratory um, out of the um, Pentagon. And um, uh, so I was asked to come back as a consultant, senior level consultant, and uh, that's when I had an aha moment that uh, mm -hmm. I was wasn't going to go back as a consultant, but I was going to go back and start a business that offered those same services or enhanced the services. So working in a forensic um, or a cyber forensic laboratory, I saw a lot of, I saw the market changing. I saw an opportunity for cyber security firms was going to be increasingly um, a big number over the next, you know, 10 years. And so, the, and I understood that space, and, the, and, and so I started a consulting firm and actually went back to the Pentagon working on that same contract. Um, and so I also saw an opportunity for growth in the um, private sector, um, some of the innovation and technology that we were deploying in the federal space with the Department of Defense. Um, so it would be a great opportunity to start um, offering those same services and, and the service offerings. So, uh, you know, 10 years ago we saw that F, um, hacking was, a, was going to be a big problem um, and, and as you see in the news now, it's a major problem. So I started working on um, getting some skilled hackers, um, you know, certified, and, and, and now we know them as ethical hackers. So this was a, a, a great opportunity um, for the company as we started to employ more certified hackers throughout the United States and eventually go globally. 
But um, one of the things that um, we started out of the gate um, with, uh, with growth issues. Uh, the company um, was postured to grow um, rapidly within the first two years, and we did. So we had um, a lot of the issues that we experienced were early on um, where, um, you know, we had a 1,500% growth rate the first year. We had a 300% growth rate the next year. And so, so we were growing so quickly, um, we had a lot of challenges, um, infrastructure and financial challenges, um, early out of the gate. Um, fast forward a couple of, uh, uh, four or five years later, um, we were facing the same issue again as, as we uh, deployed into more markets. Um, you know, our infrastructure had grown, our um, service offerings were needed. Uh, we, had, uh, we had developed other business, um, uh, you know, models where we were, we were now offering more services in that area. And so now we were facing another challenge where we were literally going to go from 400 to 1,800 in uh, less, than, uh, less than 16 months. And that's when the EY program was introduced to me. It came at the right time. It was just, it was just phenomenal timing um, that we were able to get into that program at the time uh, that we were experiencing how we were going to build out an infrastructure, grow strategically, uh, and be able to implement um, you know, the services we were being provided. So, um, and, and, and through the questions, I'll be able to answer a little bit more of how we were able to do that and what value that program brought to me and other programs uh, and other organizations that we were able to use and leverage that so that we could implement smoothly, um, we could build the infrastructure to sustain the growth and, and ultimately to continue to grow. Thank you. Very much, fellas. We'll we'll come back to you. We have a few questions. Fifteen hundred percent and three hundred percent growth. We 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 will definitely have some questions around that. I am sure. Uh, Vanessa. Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Vanessa, and I'll just give my story uh, quickly. It's a little different um, than the other folks on the call. Um, but I started my company Fin6 when I was a student at MIT. Um, we saw an opportunity in power electronics and had some um, just. Uh, very proprietary technology that had been developed by a group of engineers um, that were interested in spinning out the company. Um, we started together and, um, you know, we've actually spent the past uh, two or three years really getting the technology to the point where it can be commercial. So we're just starting our, um, we're just in the early phases of our scale up. Um, we had our first sales last year uh, as a pre-sale campaign. We used Kickstarter. Um, that was certainly an inflection point. It's brought in a lot of attention and interest to the company. Um, and we're starting to, you know, like the, um, some of the other panelists said, see competition from some of the major players who are saying, okay, everybody needs this. People need smaller uh, power electronics. How can we um, compete with what Fin6 is doing? Um, I guess one of the other um, big inflection points for us has been um, working with some kind of strategic OEM customers. Um, so for our business, we can sell uh, direct to consumers, but we can also uh, sell to big electronics companies, so laptop uh, gaming companies, home appliance, um, those types of partners. And those add a lot of value to our business, both in um, building credibility and helping us um, achieve volume really quickly. So, you know, instead of having a, you know, a, a couple thousand unit order um, from a retailer, it's more um, a million or two million units um, when you're working with some of the OEM partners. So um, having some of those um, relationships has certainly helped us accelerate our growth as well. All right, terrific. Uh, we'll start with, with Phyllis. Can you talk about the challenges of, of managing that kind of growth? And um, it, very similar to the question that we talked about a little bit earlier, when you're making the decision to scale, uh, how do you decide how you should deploy that precious capital? We'll go back and talk a little bit about how you were able to get the capital for expansion. But, again, that, that first dollar that you get for the purpose of scaling, how do you decide whether or not that goes into people resources or that goes into product offerings? How did you make that decision? And then how did you manage that kind of growth? Okay. So, uh, so first let me say on the capital side, raising the capital, I, I was very creative, <laughs> very, very creative. Um, so I did it in a non-traditional way. 
for me, um, I had great strategic partners. I had a very large company that was a mentor company. She was a woman-owned business, a little over a billion. Um, and I leveraged that mentor relationship in order to fund some of the initiatives, and, and, and we were able to leverage and team together and, uh, and use that sort of funding. So, that, so, so I didn't go the traditional route of, of uh, you know, getting investors. It was more of a strategic partnership. Um, to, to leverage that. Uh, for, for me, we, we had uh, several um, to, to decide to, uh, how we were going to spend that and how, where we were going to leverage that. I looked at it from three perspectives. Uh, we, you know, we, we knew that scaling that quickly, um, we were going to be faced with operational issues. Uh, we also looked at um, talent. Uh, in, in our field, you, you certainly have to have very skilled engineers that know, you know, know this business. So, we knew that we would, uh, and, we, and we needed to advance some of the technologies that we were deploying. So, so we had three areas that we had to focus on: the talent, um, the um, operation side, the back end, and also to the technologies where 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 we had to spend the most of, of our money. Uh, some of the uh, issues that we faced of growing too fast was we had infrastructure needs uh, in the areas of record keeping, how we were going to manage the finance, tracking, human resources, et cetera, because most of the, uh, the hackers or the, uh, the uh, engineers that we hired, um, they had to have an extensive background. They had to have um, the certifications. Uh, so, and, and a lot of these uh, where we had to keep an account, we were going to have to pay for those certifications. So we looked at um, uh, personnel issues. Um, uh, you know, our hiring practices, all of the um, issues that come with hiring ethical hackers, um, cyber insurance, you know, if you have an issue with, you know, unethical hacking. Uh, so, so, so we had to look at a lot of that. the customer service side. Um, you know, you know were, we, were we delivering quality service as we were scaling so quickly? Did we have all of the mechanisms in place to do checks and balances uh, uh, internally? Um, and then also too, uh, we had um, we had the um, uh, leadership challenges um, as well. Uh, as we grew in numbers, we had uh, you know the, the culture, the management, et cetera. So those were just a lot of the challenges that uh, that we faced all at one time as we scaled the company. And then and then less than less than a year after we thought we had it all together, we started to grow at the same end. So we were faced with those same challenges uh, less than 36 months later. Wow. Can you expand a little bit on the strategic partnership piece? Because that is, a, I think, an avenue that is often not explored by entrepreneurs, yet is a very viable one. For example, uh, many people who are spinning out of large organizations or who've worked for large organizations for a long time often they would be willing to be your first customer, which obviously can provide you with capital for uh, growth expansion, or and sometimes they're willing to be an investor. Um, and if you, or if you can find a, another large company, which it sounds like you did, uh, to provide capital or that can give you the back office or the infrastructure. So can you provide a little bit more color around the nature of the strategic relationship that you had that allowed you to get the, the expansion capital that you needed? Yes. So we, so Carl, we enrolled in a program. Uh, it was a mentor protege relationship with the Department of Homeland Security that was uh -huh. certainly approved, but approved by SBA. So what that allowed me to have was the infrastructure support in terms of the financials, the past performances, the front end, back end office, uh, project management, et cetera. All those things that a small business is typically can't get. What it also did was it allowed us to compete for larger contracts with a very large prime. So, uh, so also what that allowed uh, us to do was for them to be able to fund a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work that we were doing, at, which also in turn allowed us uh, to get, um, we had, uh, we went back and negotiated all the contracts that we worked on together where we were at a net eight. As you well know, being at a net eight, that certainly uh, gets you out of the red on anything really quick. And so for us, um, uh, leveraging that relationship with that large prime really um, uh, put us in a position where we didn't really um, 
we we ran the company without a lot of credit for almost four years, and we were very profitable doing that. Uh, and we were a zero debt company uh, uh, by that relationship. So we left. We we took advantage of a great opportunity with a large company who really saw the skill sets, really saw that the company was uh, on a fast track, and uh, they invested uh, in us through the mentor protege relationship. Wow, that's terrific. And, 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 Carrie, can you talk a little bit about uh, the process of getting your product in the stores and the use of the network uh, or even the, the mentoring that you, re that you referred to earlier? How did you do that? Because that's often, again, a very difficult thing to do. And how did uh, capital uh, play a part or, or not uh, in your ability to get it expanded as fast as you, you did into the stores? Well, the first step was, to get the product in hands of other people and have them be happy about it. Um, so the first thing I did is I, I went to the state and got a farm diversification grant for $5,000. Um, I bought the product, which by this time, dozens of people had already used and said they loved it. And um, I did a little bit of gambling, but I didn't even have a computer at that time. So um, part of it, I, I bought a computer and I put some ads on the radio and wrote the own ads, and um, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it worked really well. Uh, within a few months, we had a distributor, and uh, that was really key to getting us started. We, we went out into one channel, which was farm and home distribution, and um, we started, uh, developed a plan and, and had really tight focus. So. We started the first year with um, it was farmers farmers elevators, which I knew they had the biggest problem, right? So we started with the low hanging fruit, and then we went into implement dealerships, and then we started to go into the farm and home retail store channel, and then we went into hardware, mm -hmm. and now we're up to twelve different um, channels of distribution. So it's a multi multi channel strategy with one product. So um, what we had to do to make that happen, we have what's called a make or break, <laughs> something that we need to do each year that's really going to make or break us. And um, we knew we needed happy customers and people that told other people. So we were one of the first companies out there to use social media. And uh, we were really effective at that. So we leveraged everything that we could, PR, um, the, the training programs, everything we could get that was no cost, we did. I think I about ran the wheels off my first van, um, <laughs> going around speaking at every event that I could. And um, really, I, I went out and I, I told my story, mm -hmm. and people were engaged. And it was the women that that really helped take us into those doors and get our product turning on the shelf. Um, and we were at a disadvantage because we had a product that had never been created before. Nobody knew how to use. Back then, I didn't have a firm that helped me <laughs> design it and package it. So I really wasn't thinking of the marketing aspects of it. So it was called Fresh Cab, which really didn't mean anything to anybody. But it was the word of mouth that, that started um, making the product sell. Um, one of the other make or breaks for us was making sure that our mm -hmm. customers were making money with the product and that our margins were better than what they were getting uh, with the poison products. Even though we sit side by side on the shelf, one is $3.99, ours is $14.99. And we, were, we really had to um, talk about the value to get that product sold but once a customer used it, we knew that 90% of the time they would continue to use our product and that they'd tell three more people. So that really, really was our growth strategy, and it, it had was very consistent and focused and took us at that 45% growth. Um, but scaling is was really 100% different, and it was like nothing I'd ever seen. I, I didn't really know how to do it. Um, like in our state, for instance, we were just um, named 
number one in the top ten states for women-owned firms in both growth in number and economic clout. 66% of all firms in North Dakota are women-owned, but average revenues are 112000 So uh, there really wasn't anywhere to turn, and it's, it, the, the help gets very small and limited. Where, where do you find that help? Uh, so for me, being able to see it when I joined the Women and Women program was really game-changing. Um, one of the the key takeaways for me was really, you know, I have to first give myself permission to believe that it's possible and, and to really go out and do it. And it's a, it's a scary spot because there isn't that many people around you that understands it because they can't see it. So all of the things Carrie mentioned earlier um, about being a, uh, becoming a better leader, um, getting those networks, finding access to capital, getting advisors, becoming more visible than bold. And um, it, it's all very, very key. And Carrie might even <laughs> share what I was like when I came into the program <laughs> a couple of years ago and how much I've grown as a result of, of being a good student um, of, of those techniques. And one of the other key things that I got from the program um, was I joined the um, WeBank. And so all of a sudden we were able to gain access to some of those key retailers that we could never get meetings with. And that's, that's one of the things that really helped propel our growth, having that network. Did that answer the question, Carla? Ah, yes, it did. That's terrific. And I'm glad you ended with the network point because that is one of the most important uh, I think uh, contributing success factors that uh, entrepreneurs should focus on is that network. But I'm going to come back and ask all of you a question about the network in a second um, because part of one of the questions that has come up is, you know, how do you make the time to build that network when you're so busy uh, trying to build the business, especially in the early stages? And, and the NWBC research reports that uh, most women are sort of single employee uh, entities, and so when you're sort of carrying on everything, the marketing and the distribution to customers, you know, how do you make the time to build the network, which is really going to be as important, it sounds like, to what, with respect to what both of you have said, the network is as important as the capital that it takes to scale, but we'll come back to that, because uh, I want to ask Vanessa, you know, how did you, can you talk about the process of how you raise the money in your Series A and at what point did you connect with Astia and talk about what that has done to propel you towards this Series B? Yeah, um, so I think uh, actually the points about network are um, have been really critical for us. Um, you know, and I, for um, as we thought about our Series A, we were very fortunate to be in, in an ecosystem um, around MIT where there's a lot of advisors and um, professors and different people you can access that have experience raising money from venture investors. Um, but although they'll give you advice, they're not going to do it for you. Um, so it took, I mean, for us, a lot of hustle um, to go out and just talk to a lot of different folks, understand what resonated, what concerns they had, um, what risks they saw, um, and, you know, how they were thinking about our business. Um, I think just to give a sense for kind of the numbers at that time, um, we probably talked to you know, something on the order of 40 or 50 investors um, over the course of our um, A round fundraise. And, and I think in some regards it was necessary for us. We had to understand um, what the landscape looked like. But in order to get all those conversations, we had to use our network. Um, you know, the types of investors that we were raising from um, aren't very receptive if you come in cold, but if you come in with an introduction from someone who they've invested in before or someone else who's in their network, um, they're much more willing to take time with you and listen to your story. Um, in terms of our uh, engagement with Asia, um, we linked up with them right around the time that we did our A round, and it's proved incredibly valuable. Um, I think one of the uh, most important uh, things that we've gotten out of it is they have um, kind of a, a different pool of people than we were immediately exposed to that they could help us connect to. Um, and, they, and they also have a number of entrepreneurs in their network who 
you know, had gone through the growth stages that we were at ahead of us. Um, and as we were, you know, as I was first working with my board um, and, you know, understanding building my team and some of the things people on the call have talked about, um, about being more strategic about thinking about your business rather than just executing things, I was able to leverage a lot of the advisors um, that, you know, Asya had in their network um, to give me feedback on how to do that and, you know, how to, how to grow as a leader. That's excellent. So now let's talk about the, about this time in the network, ladies, because, again, um, if, if you think about it, we, we are focused very much on execution and delivering, and we all know that when you, you have a business, the last thing you want to do very early on is disappoint a customer, so you are overly focused on execution. Yet, you know, again, every single one of you has talked about how important the network was, how important these programs were. Uh, how would an entrepreneur... How, how should an entrepreneur think about allocating their time so that they can spend the time to network with not only other entrepreneurs but get access to programs that will give them access, for example, to large customers, either the government or private customers, because that's obviously a way to really accelerate your growth is if you can get to be a part of a supplier diversity program or have a large customer like the federal government. So knowing what you know now, how would you tell an entrepreneur to take that time to build that network, and what should they do first? And why don't, why don't we start, you know, and just go down the line with Carrie, Phyllis, and Vanessa with and adding on to the advice each time. Sure, absolutely. Well, in the beginning, you have to wear all your hats to get everything done. Um, and then things, as the business grows, it becomes about um, delegating uh, and setting the direction. When you get into the um, the area of scaling, it becomes about um, being the leader that's going to um, create that sustained innovation, business growth, change, and profitability. Okay. Uh, one of the things for me was um, in the beginning, I used to think it was luxury to network and to dream big and to think big, and to be a visionary. And, and I actually felt guilty. I have to get more done. There's two more hours in the day. I, if I can get more done, I can continue to drive this growth. But what happens, you run out of time, and you run out of bandwidth, and you run out of energy, and then you're not a very good leader to your people. So you know, I was able to, um, to, to get a good management team in place, um, it made that huge investment where the management team was running the business. Um, and then we operationalized their culture so that everybody had the same decision lens of which to make decisions. Um, and then we set up really good reporting and meeting cadence so that I always saw every day what was going on. I'm a bit of a control freak, mm -hmm. I have to admit. But at least it kept me from afar and then you went to watch and when to react. Okay. Anything to add on, Phyllis? Yeah, I would say this. It, uh, and I'm a big, um, uh, you know, a stickler for leadership. I mean, I came out of the military 22 years, and I, I believe, you know, that nothing grows without leadership. I mean, you, you cannot grow a business if you, and, and what, I, what I mean, I look at leadership in three different ways. I believe that, you know, you have to figure out what stage you are in your leadership as the company grows. When you first start a company, you are doing direct leadership. That means you're rolling up your sleeves, you're getting it done, you, you do what it takes. And, and, and I think your network becomes a direct, uh, you employ people uh, to develop networks that are very direct. They're, you know, and, and then as you start to scale and you get out of that startup phase, you have to become more of an organizational leader. Uh, and your network will became is more aligned with the organization. Um, and, and as you start to really scale, you have to look at it from a strategic leadership role. And your your network has to be strategic because it has to align now with the organization. But going back to that, I hold leaders accountable. I have organizational leaders, and I have folks that are just direct leaders. And you and you have to look at it. And and, and that goes back to EY. Uh, program, Wayne Women program, teaching you to work, uh, you know, on the business instead of in the business. 
strategic leader, you're definitely working uh, on the business and not in the business, and you're, you're actually holding leaders accountable to do direct and organizational leadership, and which gives you an opportunity to really just work on the network. So you're not glued to the business where you can't go out and develop, you know, relationships within organizations such as WPO, NEVO, you know, uh, the EY Winning Women. It frees you mm -hmm. up the time to really work strategically and how th those organizations can align with you as a strategic leader. Okay, very, very helpful. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. Uh, Vanessa, anything to add on that question? Yeah, yeah just one more um, small thing, and I think this is something that I've learned over time, so I just wanted to share. Um, as I've worked on kind of building connections that, to people that will be um, valuable for my company, um, I have found that it's very helpful um, to also make myself available um, to help and provide connections to others so that it's a two-way street. Um, so I think, you know, continuing to show up and um, being accessible has definitely helped me uh, grow my network. Um, and also um, being myself. I, you know, as a young entrepreneur, I was very tempted to try to um, be who I thought I was supposed to be as a business leader, um, and I think this uh, ties directly to Phil's comment um, about leadership, but you're uh, much more compelling if you're um, comfortable in your own skin, and developing uh, the skills and confidence to be able to do that um, has helped me tremendously both on the leadership and in the um, kind of building the connections required to grow my business um, areas. I could not agree more. I think authenticity is certainly at the heart of powerful, impactful leadership, no question about it. Uh, and let, let's go back to this, this comment about, about leadership, and I, and I love the way you uh, divided the three phases, frankly, Phyllis, into direct leadership, organizational leadership, and strategic leadership. However, the underlying thesis around that is that you have to be comfortable as you scale bringing on people. Uh, because you can't be a strategic leader if you're doing, as Carrie said, if you're actually, you know, executing all of the time. And she, she also mentioned that she put in a strong management team. So can each of you talk a little bit about that process? Because, again, our research shows that most women are reticent, most women entrepreneurs very early on as they're thinking about growing, they are very reticent around bringing on other people onto the team and delegating. Part of it is because they've been used to doing so much on their own, uh, and the thought process is if you want it right, i.e. do it yourself. We all know that, that adage. But the other issue, frankly, is around, uh, again, the capital, to go back to that, especially in, during the financial crisis. Uh, I met so many women entrepreneurs who said, oh, wow, I don't know if now is the, the, the right time to bring on somebody. My business is growing like a weed, but... You know, I'm really nervous about expanding the team. So can you all talk about how you made those decisions? What kind of people did you look for? Mistakes that you might have made when you brought on people the first time or how you had to adjust as a do-it-all leader to actually transition uh, from being an organizational leader to a strategic leader, to use your words, Phyllis. We'll start with you and then go to Vanessa and end with Carrie. Well, I, I can say this. So when... During the, the, during the phase that I was in direct leadership, um, I, I think leadership, too, goes back to how you motivate and empower people uh, to, to join the team and to stay with the team uh, and, and, and recognizing the talent that you have. Um, I think, for me, um, you know, when I, when I was operating under direct leadership, I knew that we were ready to, to bring on more direct leaders and, and empower more people to be organizational leaders. Uh, by giving them the responsibility and holding them accountable, too. So part of that was when, as we started to scale the business out and we needed to invest the dollars in those, that, those leadership skills, it, wasn't, it, it was really doing a really thorough gap analysis of what you lack in leadership before you can spend the dollars. And then looking and doing a market uh, uh, analysis and saying, okay, well, this guy's going to cost to get somebody really good and really skilled at this level, we've just got to make that investment. Maybe you shade somewhere else, but maybe this is what's needed to really uh, take you to the next level, and you, you could put less dollars here and more dollars here. 
and, and or maybe structuring a program for the talent that you need and the leadership that you need uh, for a buy-in that might not be right now, but getting those to buy in to what the company and where we're headed. So that, for me, it was uh, more of, uh, you know, as we, mm-hmm. we as we've gotten to this stage, you know, I have more organizational leaders and challenges. The challenges are not not at the bottom now. I'm dealing with how do I get those people to stay at the top as the company continues to scale. And then what, really constantly doing a gap analysis of what that leadership team needs to look like uh, in order for us to start looking at mergers and I mean, uh, acquiring other companies. So we're so I'm looking at the team. So for me, um, I, I think it, it, it really comes down to really you, you're looking at what is really needed and even sometimes bringing, bringing someone in from the outside to help you assess that. And that, that's what the EY Winning Women Program and WPO has done for me was to allow me to take a step back and really look at, you know, what, what, forward, what do we need to put uh, and invest the dollars in if we're going to truly scale and, and do it the right way. Where, who are those folks that need to to do that? Excellent, thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, we're we're still um, going through that process. So, um, you know, we're adding people to our management team on an ongoing basis. Um, and one of the things that's been most valuable is to find people who have more expertise um, and deeper experience in the in, in each field. So whether it's on the sales and marketing front, the operations side, finance, um, than uh, we do as a founding team, um, so that we can focus on um, driving the vision um, and you know kind of putting the pieces together um, and keeping everyone's priorities in line and. Um, those individuals can really be deep um, in the areas that they're working on, and they have um, a lot of relationships also that they can bring to the company. Um, so, you know, that's what we've looked for, and, and it has been um, really helpful uh, to us to get some of those folks in the team and get them working together. Terrific. And Carrie? Well, for me, um, what I did is I, I started to look at everything from scalability our systems, our people, the finance, all of that, and, and went out and I asked, um, I asked capital groups when I was at the Strategic Growth Forum, which was um, our first gift as a winning women, you get to go to this amazing place in Palm Springs. And um, I set up a lot of meetings and I talked to everybody that I could and I, and I asked questions like, okay, here's where I want to go. I'm now convinced I want to build the billion-dollar company. I want to have a whole row at these retail stores. Our, our products are innovative. What do I need to do to get from A to B? And um, well, actually A to Z in this case. But but um, hiring the right management team was was one of the things that I heard the most. And the comments were the. The business is going to change a lot when you go through different things. It changes at five million. It changes at thirty million. It changes again at a hundred million. It changes at three hundred million. It changes at a billion. And the skill set required for each of those changes is very different. So I revised my plan, um, reorganized, and and um, <laughs> got a new leadership team, like most of the women, winning women do. Um, and I and I started to look at okay, I want people that have already scaled. I want a, a team that's not going to get paralyzed in fear when they get to something that they haven't seen. And it's really important to define that and figure out exactly what kind of a skill set that you need, so mm-hmm. that the leaders can execute ahead of the growth curve. Because I need them to be executing and leading the troops, and I need to be leading the company, the vision, the strategy, um, basically building our future. So I started to hire recruiters, and these people that that we need are in high demand, and they're very costly, 
but they won't put their the real winners want to be with a winning leader and and a, and a leader that can really take them someplace. So I started focusing um, more of my time once I got those people on board with being that kind of leader that those people love to work with and that comes to work every day with incredible energy to to help us all get the job done. And part of my job is to erase any doubt of what's possible. And um, that that requires self-reflection, that requires time, that requires rest. So I'm able to take vacations now and I can take um, take time off and renew myself and, and come back supercharged mm-hmm. and keep that vision alive. Okay. Well, thank you. And the last question for today uh, is from Mary P., Who's, you know, who cited uh, the statistic that I think Carrie McPherson talked about earlier where uh, most women businesses never really get uh, beyond one or two million dollars. I think two percent was the number that Carrie mentioned very early on. So her question is, well, what can you do if you're a really small business? What are some of the sources of capital uh, that you can that you can look for that will allow you to at least get to that level and beyond? And, uh, you know, I'll throw that out for any one of you who want to talk about the source that uh, that that you use. And it might be better for you, Carrie or Vanessa, given uh, what you said earlier, Phil, it's about the strategic partner. So either one of you guys who had to look for capital very early on when you were at that level, uh, what are two or three sources that she can think about? Sure. Um, in my case, uh, we've had we've um, accessed quite a bit of venture and angel funding. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that um, now. Quite a bit of it is available online um, through sources like AngelList and um, tools like that. Uh, but that's not what we used. Um, we connected through our networks um, both to venture investors uh, who are more institutionalized and run a very tight process. Um, about you know funding funding startups um, and for us because we had the technology differentiation I think it was easier for us to access that pool um, and then angel investors as well uh, many of whom are at least in, in our case more about um, the relationship uh, so getting to know you as an entrepreneur and then investing in um, you and your team and with the belief that I that you will be able to make your business successful um, those folks uh, we access. Uh, a lot through our university, and I think even though we happen to be there, uh, it's definitely not necessary, even now that we're well out of school, um, going back uh, both to my undergrad and um, and MIT and finding people who are excited about what um, people are working on um, from the university has been a great source for us. Um, and then also just being open to meeting people, you know, like we, we um, went to some trade shows last year and met a couple people there who have ended up being great investors um, as, as angel investors. So um, there's a lot of different ways to meet them. Um, a couple of other sources just to mention, um, we, we did a, a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so we uh, used Kickstarter to launch our first product. Um, and that was pretty successful. Um, those are well understood now, um, and so you know investors, know, investors or you know people who are participating in Kickstarter know that they're backing um, your product and not taking equity. So they're not actually investors, um, but they're backers and they understand that, and so they're they're pretty excited about what you're doing and excited to be a part of the story. Um, and then uh, also, you know, we have um, been able to access capital from some of our larger uh, OEM customers. Um, so that's another good source as well as you have a big customer who's excited about what you're working on, um, it can, you know, we, we were uh, not sure, but it was definitely worth our while to say, hey, would you think about, um, you know, giving us some money for this development, what, would, what terms would be required um, so that we could get that kind of relationship in place. So we've, we've gotten money from a lot of different sources, um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of different places to turn. That that is terrific. Thanks, Vanessa. Anything to add, Carrie? Sure. For me, I started with nothing. I had nothing. Um, that got that five hundred dollar loan to start with. Um, co-signed on that. Went out and got some grants, and um, just got really smart about our growth strategy. So grants from nonprofit organizations. 
I, I got a grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture for um, a farm diversification and also for um, value added because we were bringing out products that actually provided new markets for farmers. So that helped us pay for part of the registration cost with EPA. Originally, we were told it would cost $2 million, and we were told that it would be impossible to do because um, regulations would have to be changed, new protocols could be written, and it, it wasn't possible. Um, I didn't give up. So, so to fund that, I sold produce from our farm. Um, I sold North Dakota-based potpourri into mm -hmm. several hundred retailers and, until the market fell out from that. Um, I was pretty much determined that I didn't want to use my own money because I was using my own time. It always started like that, um, and I think it made me a much better business person because I didn't have anybody to really ask for for that fund. So, so operationally, we started to develop our our business so that it wasn't labor and capital intensive like most manufacturers mm -hmm. are. So I started early thinking I'm not going to own anything and I would just lease the equipment that I needed and add it as I needed. And back then that, that wasn't common for manufacturers. We didn't own our buildings. So we rented everything and, and it kept those costs off the balance sheet and allowed me to build the entire business on cash flow. So I knew we'd have to have a, at least a 20% EBITDA if we were con going to continue to fund our growth, which we could grow at 30 to 40% um, off our cash. So our, even our business model um, was developed around thinking about, you know, finance, how, how we're going to scale that. We started developing um, a web presence mm -hmm. very early on before anybody did. Um, and our strategy was to get people to the retailer, educate people about our product. But it's always consistently been 10, 10 to 15 percent of our revenues, which was cash in the bank um, within two days. So we've used that to fund our growth as well. Um, also, being from North Dakota, we have um, a, a state-owned bank. So the bank was able to come in mm -hmm. and give us a sign-off on our first um, revolving loan. So it helped us provide, purchase the inventories that we needed to sell and get our growth. And um, as long as we were, you know, paying good salaries, um, developing our people, creating something really good for the state. So that's been a, a, a good partner for us. Um, also working with our vendors. We've got very trusted relationships. So we've, we worked with small vendors. We purchased our ingredients from family farmers. Um, and they've, they've always trusted us. The price hasn't went up and down um, because we've stayed proactive and a year ahead um, in, in most cases. So that's added more um, to the cash flow as well. And more recently now with, with all this incredible growth, um, now we're getting to the point where we're able to bring on um, capital. And, and we've already have um, several people that would like to do um, private capital. There, there's a lot of those out there. Um, and again, we look through the filter of, uh, you know, what's the goal. And it's, it's important that we keep a triple bottom line for my company, which is people, planet, and profit. So that wow. also determines our finance strategy. Yes. Wow. Well, this is terrific. I, I, I hate to cut this conversation off because we're really getting into the meat of the how-to now. Uh, but we are running out of time, so let me just say a few words to wrap, wrap us up. Uh, but let me first give a big, big thank you to our panelists and speakers. First, Carrie, Teresa, and John, thank you for joining and sharing more information about your programs. Uh, we'll be posting the information and links to your websites. And finally, to Vanessa, Carrie, and Phyllis, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your stories. We know these journeys are not easy. Uh, we so appreciate your honesty and candidness uh, for all of those who are listening today. I know I certainly learned a lot, and I know that our audience participated in as well. It has truly been a, been a pleasure, and this is a perfect way for us to close a monumental year of progress for women entrepreneurs uh, is with the stories of game-changing successes. Uh, I say thank you to all of you on behalf of the full council 
and our live audience. We are very grateful for your time, your stories, and your words of advice. To my fellow council members, thank you for your continued engagement and efforts to support women entrepreneurs across the country. And let me publicly acknowledge our council members that are rolling off in the next few months, uh, Roz Alford, Tina Biles-Williams, and Jamie Knack. To the three of you, I thank you so much for your commitment to the council and to this cause in particular. You all have served this council and the community of women entrepreneurs graciously and dutifully. We are very grateful for your many contributions, and I must warn you that we will continue to call upon you for your expertise and your leadership as part of the council alumni. Mm -hmm. And to the staff, Amanda Brown, Christina Flores, Erin Kelly, Samika, Samita Mukapaidai, and Miriam Siegel, a special thanks to you for helping pull this exciting meeting and conversation together. And I must give a shout out to our partners and friends at ENY, Astia, and to the SBA for your support of this event. And to the audience, thank you, thank you for joining us today. And please stay in touch with us. We are the National Women's Business Council, an independent voice for women entrepreneurs to the White House, the Congress, and the SBA. And we are here to support you. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. We will post links to the recording of today's program and other resources on both these channels and our website. And with that, let me say that our meeting is officially adjourned at 401. Thank you all for participating today.